Hello and welcome to the session on preparing sacred commerce for special events. In this session, we'll be covering specific steps involved in the preparation process. Now, as we go through the session, I encourage you to ask your questions and join the conversation on LinkedIn and Twitter using hashtags Commerce Summit and CyCorCommerce. So let's take a look at what you should expect in the next 30 to 45 minutes. We'll start with a brief introduction. I'll tell you a few words about myself and the company I represent, Team One. Then we'll take a look at what made me put this material together. We'll look at the reasons for the ongoing problems during special events. Of course, the majority of the session will be dedicated to covering the steps involved in the preparation process. And finally, towards the end, we'll take a look at how we can fast track the preparation process. As you're about to see, the process itself is pretty involved, so we'll take a look at some ideas on uh, that can help us reduce our timeline. And finally, since there are many other things that are outside of our control, no matter how well we prepare, I'll give you some ideas on how to fail in style if you were to experience a website outage. So my name is Vasily Fomichev. I'm a director of the Psycro practice at Team One. I've been working with Psycro for over 11 years now, and uh, for the past six years, I was uh, fortunate enough to carry the Psycro MVP title in technology, e-commerce, and ambassador categories. For the past six years, uh, I managed uh, various Psycro practices in various capacities. Uh, the last being Psycro Commerce practice. And at heart, I'm a technology enthusiast. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time recently working in Azure on artificial intelligence and blockchain. Now, I represent a company called Team One, which is part of the Publicis Group. And Publicis Group is a global um, multinational group of agencies with uh, over 84,000 employees. Team One itself is a modern full-service agency. Uh, that focuses on helping premium brands. And uh, when we say premium, what we mean by that is brands that focus not so much on cost uh, differentiation, but rather differentiating their product by providing premium type of product or service. When we say we're full service, we really mean that. As you can tell here, we cover everything from uh, global brand identity and strategy, getting into media, media buying, search, advertising, uh, social, public relations, and finally, digital and tech. Uh, in fact, digital and tech accounts for the fifth of our company. So technology has always been in the DNA of Team One. We are a Cycro Silver partner and uh, a Microsoft Gold partner. So now that we're done with the introductions, let's dive into the content. So here is the slide um, that will show you the reason why I started on the path of investigating problems with outages during special events. I saw an article on retail touch points in uh, 2018 mentioning that Walmart, J.Crew, GameStop, Lululemon, Alta Beauty, Lowe's, Best, Stop, Best Buy, and Home Office Depot all experienced two plus hours of outages during the Thanksgiving holiday season in 2018, with Walmart accounting for estimated $9 million in lost sales. Now, before the understanding I always had was that uh, it is the brands that have low budgets, that use legacy technologies with untrained teams, are usually the ones who experience outages. However, these are big brand names. They manage big budgets. So that got me thinking and launched me on a, a series of research and interviews of clients and delivery teams in 2019, which eventually resulted in a presentation at the Cycro Symposium on this topic. And in 2019, during the Thanksgiving weekend, I kept an eye open out uh, on the websites for these brands. And fortunately, most of them, all of them held up. Uh, Office Depot was holding on by a thread. However, it did remain stable, but pages were loading very slowly. However, Costco was now um, accounting and, and, and uh, uh, being on the news accounting uh, for the news about outages. So, uh, in fact, I was 
uh, browsing for a new vacuum cleaner during the Thanksgiving shopping uh, sales event on Costco when all of a sudden when clicking a link uh, the page went blank with a generic message in the top left corner so that's when Costco started experiencing their outage my knee-jerk reaction was to go to the mobile app however unfortunately uh, Costco's mobile app is simply a wrapper around the responsive version of their website so all in all the website was down and the mobile app were down for um, over 16 hours and that resulted in, a, in the estimated 11 million dollars in sales according to New York Post so outages aren't really the main problems uh, or only problems that websites can experience According to BigCommerce, 53% of your visitors will abandon your website if it takes more than three seconds to load. And I challenge every single person watching this section uh, to go and check the critical pages involved in the conversion funnel on your e-commerce websites and measure their load time. You'll be surprised by how long it actually takes uh, for some pages to load, as you'll find out. Now, if that wasn't enough, for every additional second, in addition to that, you're going to incur a 20% penalty in your conversion rates. So if we're talking about, a let's say, a Thanksgiving weekend again, uh, if your website takes upwards of 5 seconds to load, your pages take upwards of 5 seconds to load, you're no longer having a Thanksgiving sales. You're just having a very expensive day with conversion rates lower than usual. So what are the problems? What causes these failures? Obviously, technology cannot be the main reason uh, because we can scale up and down vertically and horizontally. Uh, applications, modern applications are uh, very advanced that can handle uh, various types of traffic. So technology cannot be the problem. And as we saw budgets, um, even if the big companies like Walmart aren't enough to um, provide proper preparation for these events. So after doing research on this topic, I came to a conclusion that there are four main problems that are at the core of these outages. The first problem being the lack of leadership's understanding and prioritization. Now, I'm not talking about the common sense of understanding of the importance of preparing for special events. It's um, obviously important to make sure that your we uh, website remains stable. Uh, you don't need to uh, uh, stress that point. However, it's the understanding of the proper preparation process and combined with the bias towards your own organization. As I mentioned previously, I was always under impression personally that it's always the other website that's going to fail not our internal website because we have a strong team in place we have strong infrastructure we have a modern application that supports our website however that is not enough so that's reason number one reason number two is lack of complete process uh, even when teams do start preparing for the special event uh, the, their preparation process is uh, uh, very small and it skips a lot of steps so not following properly through all the steps we're about to cover normally would add a lot of risk. Now reason number three is lack of testing and originally I intended to include that in uh, reason number two, lack of complete process. However, this problem is so common so that I decided to include that as a separate point. And finally, even if we do have the proper um, skill set on board and, and the willingness, we frequently run into the bottom line of lack of time and resources. So hopefully now knowing that even the big brands can fail uh, and uh, fail to prepare the website correctly for a special event, uh, you understand the importance of the proper preparation process. So in the rest of the session we'll focus on the final three points, the lack of complete process, lack of testing, lack of time and resources. So that leads me into my favorite quote by Warren Buffett. Someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. That leads me into the main first point 
of the preparation steps is start the process early, especially if this is your first time going through the entire process um, or uh, going through all of the steps displayed here on the screen. So that your first step is going to be creating a plan and you want to do that two to three months in advance. And as you can see, there are 10 steps that we would need to go through before we can consider ourselves ready for the special event. So when we start creating a plan, what you could really do is take a screenshot of this slide right here and that will be your outline for the preparation plan. At the end of the session, you'll have the tools and the knowledge to allow you to estimate the resource allocation as well as the schedule for the preparation plan. So now that we've started a plan, we need to start putting our team together. And when we put our team together, we want to make sure to have representation from three areas business, technology, and third-party dependencies. For the business side, we want to have someone similar to a product owner to be on the team to make sure uh, business priorities are followed and dollars are spent correctly. From the tech side, we would normally include representation from managed services for the infrastructure support, DevOps for process automation and communication, alignment and development for the application support. Finally, we want to have third-party uh, dependencies including in the preparation, included in the preparation process, and we'll talk a little more on this in the following slides. So now that we have a team together, we need to start, uh, and the plan, we need to start, mov start moving forward with it. And that leads me into my next favorite quote by a famous American philosopher, Mike Tyson, Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Documentation. Documentation is essential in times of stress. Unfortunately, stress during uh, work is translated by our nervous system into the life-threatening uh, type of stress that uh, we experience, experience sub subconsciously. And there are really two reactions to that. There is... Um, either uh, people are going to either freeze or they're going to act quickly, unfortunately, most frequently making irrational decisions. So assume half of your team is going to start making irrational decisions and the other half is going to freeze. So making sure that we have proper and clear documentation in place with specific steps is essential. So here are the things that you want to have included in your documentation at the bare minimum. List of internal stakeholders, roles, availability, and contact information. Everyone needs to be crystal clear on everyone who's involved, their roles, their availability, and involvement through the preparation process, and especially during the special event, and their contact information, the rules of engagement. You also want to have similar records for third-party dependencies. You also want to have references to internal processes for escalation and disaster recovery if something were to happen. Again, remember, half of your team is going to freeze, so you want to have clear step-by-step -step instructions to follow in the times of the outage. You want to also include detailed support plan with specific responsibilities. The support plan needs to be spelled out as clearly as possible and every member of the team needs to be clear on their individual responsibilities. Also avoid placing the same responsibility on multiple people otherwise you run into a bystander event. In other words if you have a responsibility given to uh, something uh, uh, given to more than one person it has a lower chance of actually getting done so make sure that responsibilities individual responsibilities assigned to individual stakeholders and finally the documentation needs to include a list of known risks and their potential impact and we'll talk about how to create that list of known risk risks in um, the slides towards the end of the process. Uh, everyone on the team needs to be clear on what could potentially happen or what we expect to likely happen if the things did go wrong so the team can at the very least prepare mentally.
So now that we have the documentation, we need to start engaging our dependencies as soon as possible. So what are dependencies? Dependencies include anything that our application depends on for normal operation. And that could be as large as our infrastructure or as small as our front-end analytics like Google, for instance. There are a couple main reasons why we want to engage with our dependencies as early as possible. One is they may have their own preparation processes internally that we would want to align with. And two, third parties may actually provide services to help prepare for a special event. For instance, Microsoft Azure can assign a dedicated technical account manager who can facilitate and help with capacity planning, support during the testing process, and during the event itself, set up an operational war room. It's important to engage dependencies as early as possible because these become uh, a, a lengthy process because there's a lot that's involved here that's, that will be outside of your control. So now that we have dependencies engaged, the next step uh, is to start forecasting. There are two facets to the forecasting step. Uh, one is forecasting timing uh, for uh, the application to be in the hyper mode or scaled mode. And two is forecasting the amount of traffic or the, the amount of the volume that our application would need to be prepared for. So timing is going to, of course, depend on the type of the event uh, and marketing and advertising, of course, efforts that will be involved. For instance, here on the screenshot from Bloomberg, we have a traffic pattern that's specific to a Thanksgiving event. So if we're talking about a Thanksgiving event specifically as an example, we would want to start preparing about a week prior to Black Friday and, want, and remain in that scaled out setup for up to one to two weeks after the Cyber Monday event. Now again, the traffic patterns and timing will vary based on the type of event that you're preparing. So your increase in traffic uh, could either be gradual or it could be a flash spike. So make sure that you collaborate with your marketing efforts uh, to predict the type of traffic and the, the timing and the type of traffic to expect. So we briefly touched on traffic. So to estimate traffic, there are really three ways to go about it. The easiest way is, of course, if we've been through a similar type of event, is reusing historical event data. So if we have analytics from a previously previous similar event, we can use that combined with the current marketing efforts to estimate the traffic um, um, uh, to expect that we would expect during that special event. Now, if we are launching a brand new commerce uh, web front or uh, we don't yet have analytics for a similar type of event, we can use tools such as Google Keyword or Google Trends to estimate uh, the level of interest um, around the timing of the special event and combine that with uh, our internal marketing forecasts. Now, if all fails, if we don't have reliable analytics, if Google Trends doesn't um, show us any valuable information, and uh, in fact, uh, our marketing department has uh, a wide range of expected outcomes from their marketing efforts, uh, the final step would be to provide, uh, uh, to do basic industry-based research. Um, there are plenty of analyst white papers out there that cover either identical or similar events um, with their uh, specific uh, specifics around traffic and volume. Let's take a look at an example of how we can calculate traffic for an event uh, such as Thanksgiving uh, holiday sales. Looking back at 2019, this, according to Wall Street Journal, the sales between Wednesday and Black Friday were estimated to rise 26.4%. 20, uh, Cyber Monday sales were estimated to go up by 18%. So to round that up, let's say uh, we would be looking at an increase of 30%. So what we want to do is take the largest spike of the previous uh, year's Thanksgiving holiday and add 30% to that, or multiply it by 130%. Now, if we didn't have analytics from the previous year and we didn't know what to expect, Google Trends, uh, didn't give us any actionable information, 
through the industry research, we would find that it is recommended to scale out by at least 500%. So what we would normally do is we would take the average monthly traffic and multiply it by five to get the uh, estimated traffic during the special event. So now that we have our uh, forecast, before jumping into testing, first what we want to do is make sure that we have proper monitoring tools in place. Remember, if you cannot measure, you cannot manage. Proper monitoring is important not only for reviewing uh, the special event, but also uh, it can also provide early warning signs, early signs of at the application failure uh, that can help you or, and your team make adjustments to remain the application running. So here are some of the types of monitoring that are important to focus on during the preparation process. Availability. You want to make sure that you have monitoring in place that monitors service availability. You want to be the first one to find out when things do fail. You want to make sure that health monitoring is in place. Now this type of monitoring is going to provide early signs of an outage. For instance, a web server will start responding with errors once in a while. So this could be an early sign of a, an upcoming failure. Security. As, you can, as you'll see on the following slides, uh, special events um, are a time liked by bots, scrollers, and hackers. So it's important to have proper intrusion detection, detection tools in place as well. And finally, we want to make sure that we have performance measurement tools, uh, which are, again, not only good for um, uh, reviewing performance uh, after the special event, but also can provide early signs of an upcoming failure. For instance, pages taking longer and longer to load. So with the monitoring tools in place, we can finally start testing. Now, as I mentioned earlier, lack of proper testing is one of the main reasons for poor preparation. So if it has not been tested recently, it does not exist. This is one of the most important takeaways um, of this session. So here are some of the tests that you want to include in your preparation plan. First, test alerts. This is the type of test that's most frequently missed in the preparation process. I've seen a couple of times when companies got informed through their social channels by their own customers that their website was out. Now, how embarrassing is that? So you don't want to be in their shoes and make sure that you are and your team are the first to find out if something does go wrong. Test your disaster recovery. Most setups that I've worked with and delivered had disaster recovery in place. The important point here is that the disaster recovery needs to be tested as close as possible to the event. Unfortunately, these types of things get only tested once or twice throughout the year. However, if it's been more than, let's say, three months, I highly recommend retesting your disaster recovery procedure. The reason for that is because software updates and hardware updates can change the interface and the steps that would be involved in the disaster recovery process. And you don't want to find out that your step-by-step -step instru instructions are not accurate during the outage. Load test is perhaps the most common test that's run in the preparation process. And uh, it, what you want to do is you want to run the load test based on the forecast from the previous steps. It's essentially simulating the traffic forecasted for the special event and monitor the application to make sure that it remains stable under that load. Now the next type of test is rarely or is, is frequently missed, uh, which is called the stress test. Now you want to run the stress test on two types of setup, normal and scaled. Stress test is a type of performance steps, uh, performance test uh, that puts your application under an increased um, type of load until it reaches a point of failure. So essentially, the point of a stress test is to find the point of failure of your application. In the first case, we want to find that point of failure during your normal setup, outside of your special event. And then the second uh, test aims to find that breaking point during the scaled out 
setup um, after scaling your application based on the previously forecasted traffic numbers. The reason why you want to run both of them is to get that ratio between the increase in the infrastructure and uh, the difference in traffic. This ratio will become important during the special event if the amount of traffic that will be coming to your website will exceed the previously estimated numbers and it will allow you to quickly calculate the additional increase in resources that will need to be required to um, cover the additional traffic. And finally we want to run a page, page load speed test. The most important thing here is that we want to run that test during the load test. Frequently this type of test is run during normal operational hours and numbers look great. However, once the system was placed under load, numbers come out to be very different. So you want to make sure that this test is run during the load test to simulate the actual page load speed during the special event. Now it's not enough to simply run these tests and deliver a series of graphs, graphs and numbers and, and page load speed uh, numbers. What you want to do uh, is provide a risk report, which is a proper deliverable from the, of the testing stage. This risk report should include a list of risks um, gathered from these tests, as well as steps to mitigate them or action items. So again, simply running the tests and reporting on the test results is not enough. A proper deliverable needs to be a risk report with action items for mitigating and removing these risks. Now that is something that's actionable and will be used in future steps in the preparation, in the rest of the preparation process. So after we've run our tests, uh, before we get into the next steps, one um, bit of definition I want to be very clear about, uh, previously we briefly touched on disaster recovery which frequently gets um, uh, gets replaced by a new term called high availability. Uh, now high availability became a, a popular term in the technology space with popularization of cloud uh, infrastructure setups. Uh, cloud infrastructure supported by AWS and Azure for instance make it very easy to set up multi-regional uh, setups allowing to fail over to another region easily, uh, almost seamlessly, if let's say a region were to uh, experience a failure. Now this is the one of the biggest um, uh, reasons why high availability started getting used in, in place of disaster recovery by technology teams. However, it is not the same thing. Disaster recovery aims to recover mission critical functionality of the application from a variety of various issues, while high availability simply focuses on retaining uptime and performance. So yes, high availability helps in a case of a regional outage. However, it's absolutely useless in a case if your application were to get hacked. In that case, all regions would need to be rolled back, for instance. And this is why it's important to treat both disaster recovery and separate as as separate items and include both in your preparation plan. Now if you're just starting with Cycle Commerce and considering various uh, hosting options, it's important to consider them from uh, uh, the side of preparing for a special event because it will affect the total cost of ownership of the application. So there are generally tr three options when we talk about hosting for Cycle Commerce on-premise, direct cloud, and Cycro managed uh, cloud. If you choose to run Cycro Commerce on-premise, it will be the hardest to scale and of course have the highest cost to it. Direct cloud hosting uh, on something like Azure uh, will be uh, easier, much easier to scale than the on-premise setup and perhaps have the lowest cost if you have the templates in place and trained personnel. Uh, SiteCore Cloud is the third option and is perhaps the easiest to scale because the work is done by SiteCore. However, you know, there's, there's cost that comes with that. If you do decide to go the SiteCore Cloud route, I would recommend you to look into the HADR configuration that's available to premium level customers, especially if you go through special event preparation frequently or plan to with your SiteCore Commerce setup. 
Now, here's uh, what scaling of the Cycle Experience platform looks like. Now, you're looking at uh, a list of all components that go into a fully scaled Cycle Experience uh, setup. Now, don't try to uh, read into those. That's not the point of the slide. The point of the slide is to show the components that would need to be scaled uh, in preparation for a traffic increase. And at the bare minimum, you are looking at increasing three components, web database, core database, and content delivery. Of course, depending on your particular implementation, there will be other elements and components of the Cycle Experience platform that would need to be scaled. For instance, your analytics, reporting, and search, uh, or identity server. However, these three are the bare minimum. Now it's even easier with Sitecore Experience Commerce side. You are only looking at, it, at increasing uh, and scaling the shared environments database and the shops application. So let's get back to our preparation. We previously briefly touched on security monitoring and intrusion detection. And that is the next step of our preparation process. Uh, is making sure that our application is secure. Because not all traffic is good. And uh, uh, according to Digital Commerce, if we take Thanksgiving as an example, during that uh, special event, there's a 20% increase in bot traffic and 23% increase in simple and sophisticated attacks. Of course, it's good news that these attacks are simple and unsophisticated and you would be tempted to simply block it. However, 64% of these attacks are clever enough to be coming or appear to come from the same regions as your customer or as your site. There's also an increase in distributed denial of service attacks. These are the types of attacks that are aimed specifically aimed at bringing your uh, infrastructure application um, down out of service. And there's uh, an increase of 129% during the Thanksgiving shopping season. So here are the things, the low-hanging fruit action items that you can implement to block some of that bad bot traffic. So one is you could look at implementing app service environments if you're on Azure. This will help to isolate your network. Now there are some concerns and some things to be careful about when uh, you consider this type of setup with Sitecore. So make sure to check with Sitecore support before uh, proceeding uh, to implementing app service environments. Web application firewall is an important piece of any site or implementation um, and it's relatively easy to set up especially if you're running on uh, Azure Cloud. Web application firewalls nowadays um, use artificial intelligence algorithms to automatically detect anomalies and, and bad traffic and have become pretty accurate. And finally, perhaps the easiest um, action item to add to your preparation plan is enabling Sitecore bot detection. The uh, latest uh, version of Sitecore comes with a uh, robot detection feature, which allows us to um, block requests coming from, let's say, certain uh, unwanted user agents. Now, it's also important to include visitor identification line in all your pages to make sure that actual website visitors don't get flagged as bots not and that's important not only for your reporting purposes but it also takes some load off of your uh, reporting and processing instances of Sitecore. Now what about hackers? Hackers love special events and although there are books written about securing web applications that topic is outside of uh, the scope of this session uh, but again, here's, uh, here's some things to consider in your preparation process, some low-hanging fruit that can be included even on a short notice. Consider having a team of members assigned to monitor for um, fraud and bot attacks. Block outdated user agents in browsers. Many modern front-end frameworks don't support the outdated browsers anymore, and uh, sometimes that can result in uh, ex and an exposure of some sensitive information about the application setup. So it's easier to simply block those outdated browsers. For instance, Internet Explorer 6. 
there there's no valid reason that anyone should be using any valid user should be using that browser now you also want to monitor for an increase in failed validation of credit card numbers and failed logins these are early signs of a brute force attack on your application and finally block all traffic coming from the following data centers DigitalOcean, GigaNet, OVH Hosting and Chupa LLC uh, these data centers have been proven time and time again to be sources of uh, malicious traffic and, and attacks on websites so now that we have our list of actions from the testing stage and list of action items from uh, the securing part of the preparation process it's time to put those action items to their cost so first what we want to do is calculate the total cost of action item implementation and that will be later used to compare that to the potential loss to the business and here's what that means so it's uh, to calculate the cost of an implementation of an action item we would want to add up all of the effort as well as potential infrastructure costs, licensing costs, so direct and indirect costs uh, in, um, involved in actioning on, on that item. To calculate the potential loss, what we want to do is estimate the probability of that risk resulting in a business loss multiplied by the dollar amount of that, poten uh, of that loss. So now you might end up with multiple uh, variations of probabilities and, and types of business loss that could occur from a single risk. So what you want to do here is to pick the combination that will result in the biggest potential loss and loss to the business and that's what will be used to compare that to the cost of the uh, action item implementation. So taking this approach allows us to uh, take an objective view at the need for implementing these action items. So now that we have an action item, the cost of its implementation and the potential loss to the business, uh, we can use that information to take one of three actions on those risks and action items. So we can either accept the risk and we would want to do that when uh, the cost of the implementation or the, the action item exceeds the potential loss to the business. Uh, we may choose to mitigate the risks that is in a situation that's vice versa when the loss to the business exceeds the cost of uh, the fix. And finally, we may choose to simply remove the risk altogether. Let's take a look at an example here. So one of the frequent reasons for uh, um, a delayed page speed is inclusion of various types of analytics and an excessive number of tags um, on, on a web page. So if we want to, for instance, accept the risk, in this case, the business would accept the lower, uh, the risk of the lower conversion rate in, in the trade and trading that in for access to the analytics data during the special event period. Now, if we cannot accept the lower conversion rates, one of the two options that we have on the table here is mitigating the risk. So in this case we may either uh, reduce the amount of analytics that we're gathering or uh, reduce the um, uh, amount of tagging that's implemented on the website and only keep track of the most uh, important core metrics. Finally, if we cannot accept a risk of lower conversion, we may choose to sacrifice uh, the analytics uh, and measuring our, our traffic for the period of the special event. Uh, to retain our page speed and conversion rate by completely removing analytics from our website. So after this step, what we will end up with normally is a list of accepted risk items and that list needs to be included in our documentation mentioned in our earlier slides and all stakeholders involved in the preparation process need to be familiarized with, uh, with the list of accepted risks. We'll also end up with a list of risks and action items that would need to be mitigated or removed. And that would be the, um, that would be your backlog to be addressed between now and between this step and 
the uh, time of the event. At the time, uh, at the time of the completion of this step, finally, we are prepared to take on the special event. So that leads me to the final quote from Steve Jobs. There is always one more thing to learn. So even if the event, the special event was successful and the application remains stable, it is important to review and learn. Now it may sound like a cliche here in this case, however, let me give you some numbers from LinkedIn to make this point a bit more important. Uh, so LinkedIn says that there is a 14.9% annual turnover in the technology industry, specifically in the internet vertical. Now the retail and consumer products industry is not far behind with a 13% annual turnover rate. What that translates into is um, that there is a very good chance that one of your six to seven uh, teammates or employees will be leaving this year. And with them, they'll take all the knowledge and experience that they accumulated from this preparation process and going through the special event. So it's important to document not only uh, findings in a case of failure, but also in the case of success. So you want to record and document measurements from the special event. When I presented this uh, session at a uh, Sitecore user group in uh, Los Angeles, one of the attendees mentioned that they recorded their measurements during the special event and their application remained stable. And while everyone was celebrated, celebrating, they looked at the measurements that they took and they were surprised how close they came to a point of failure. So you want to also look for anomalies and compare that with your um, estimates and expectations and adjust your preparation process and risk management process accordingly. Finally, oh, you want to perform retrospectives and always continue improving on the process. And if the application were to experience uh, a failure, you want to, of course, do a proper thorough investigation of the failure and, again, adjust your process accordingly. So as you can see at this point, the process is pretty involved. So how do we perform all of these steps if we only have a handful of weeks to get ready for a special event? Well, taking away any of the steps mentioned here in the list is not recommended because that will add a lot of risk to the uh, preparation process. So what I would recommend is taking alternative approaches um, to scoping each individual preparation item and uh, its implementation. For instance, when we create a team, side on creating a leaner, leaner team. Smaller teams run much faster and more efficiently. Create, the uh, create only vital documentation. Avoid reinventing a wheel. For instance, include references rather than rewriting the book. When we start looking at dependencies, consider outsourcing them completely instead of engaging with them. When we look at the testing stage of the process, consider running multiple tests at the same time. For instance, combine the load test with the stress test. Consider outsourcing security altogether. And when it comes to addressing risks, side on the side of removing the risk altogether rather, rather than mitigating it. So, as much as we can try to cover all the potential risks, there are unforeseen variables and things outside of our control. So as, as good of a preparation process we can go through, there's still a chance that our application will experience a failure. And here is here are some ideas on how to retain your brand, brand image if this were to occur. Now, when I was putting this list together, first thing that came to my mind is uh, the initial scene from one of the Pirates of the Caribbean's episodes where Jack Sparrow is standing on top of the ship and the camera starts zooming out and Jack is proudly looking out into the horizon as the, and as the camera zooms out we see that he's actually standing on top of a sinking ship but that doesn't seem to phase him at all. So here are some ideas on how we can re remain Jack Sparrow like Jack Sparrow in the face of an outage. So if you're working with an e-commerce implementation that spans across multiple countries, if 
business rules allow, consider redirecting traffic to, the, to another country. It's better to retain some business inside the company than none at all. Now, if you're experiencing an outage, uh, have the application team look into uh, um, the reason for the outage. And if the application cannot be restored, it is possible sometimes to take the problematic part out of the website altogether. Even if that uh, results in the inability of users to process their transactions, it's better to have some <laughs> or part of your website up than no website at all. Now, if you cannot bring the website back up, don't just simply show a generic error message. Re refer your visitors to your customer service call center and give them some type of incentive, perhaps a coupon or a discount, because that'll help them retain good experience with your brand. And at the end of the day, that is really what matters. And that leads us to the end of the session on preparing Psycho Commerce for special events. Now I do see that we have some questions already on social networks. I will make sure to answer every single one of them. If you do have follow-up questions later, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn or through uh, the following websites, team1-usa.com forward slash sitecore or cmsbestpractices.com. Thank you for joining.